So the basic idea for uh, heating and cooling curves is this. If you want to find the time for a phase change or a phase, you just have to find the final time for that phase or phase change and subtract the initial time for that phase or phase change from it. All right, for time spent in solid, liquid, and gas phases, obviously you just, have to, you just have to isolate the solid, the liquid, and the gas phases and find the changes in time. Right, for a question where you have to find the time required to melt a sample and to boil, uh, vaporize the sample, you just have to isolate the phase changes and subtract the final initial times for that phase change by itself. To find the total amount of time required to completely convert a sample to, to liquid from its starting solid phase, you would just have to do um, the time up to the end of melting minus the time for where you began heating. And to calculate the time required to uh, completely convert it to vapor, you just have to find the time required to completely vaporize it or the end of vaporization and subtract from it the time that you started heating. In this case, the time required to completely get to melting would be five minutes and the time that you started is zero, so you do zero minus five or uh, five minutes. And to get to the time required to completely um, convert a sample to vapor, you just have to get to the end of vaporization, obviously, since vaporization converts something to vapor, and the starting time will be zero, so you do 14 minus zero, giving you 14 minutes, okay? So that's it just there. All right, so for number five, it says interpreting partial heating and cooling curves. As we know, heating and cooling curves look something like this, where you always have three phases here for um, a cooling curve, gas, liquid, and solid, and two phase changes here for the cooling curve. Um, condensation here and freezing here. Similarly, for heating curves, you also have three phases, solid, liquid, and gas here, here, and here, and you have two phase changes, um, melting here, evaporation here. So in both cases of full heating and cooling curves, you have three phases and two phase changes, right? On the other hand, with partial heating and cooling curves, you'll often only have two phases and um, one phase change, okay? So so, like I just said, what you'll often encounter with a partial heater and cooling curve is something like this, where you have only two phases, like something like this and this, and you only have one phase change, which looks something like this, all right? And now let's dissect the idea of, like, how to analyze partial heating and cooling curves. The first positive or negative slope you encounter will always be the first phase given. It's the phase you start out with according to the problem. It's not necessarily a gas or a solid. It depends on what the problem tells you the first phase is. So the first negative or positive slope is the first phase you're given based on um, what the problem tells you is the phase you start out with. All right? Now, the first... An only plateau that you run into um, on a heat, partial heating or cooling curve is the phase change that occurs between the first and second phase. All right, and obviously the temperature of this plateau would be the melting or boiling point depending on which phase change is represented. If you have boiling or evaporation represented, it's obviously the boiling point, but if the plateau represents melting, then that would obviously be, be the melting point, right? And in any case, the plateau is just like before um, with the real traditional heating or cooling curve. The plateau represents the phase change between the first and second phase. Finally, we have the second and final phase on this um, partial heating or cooling curve, and the second positive or negative slope represents the second phase or the final phase mentioned in the problem. Okay? So just know that unlike um, full heating and cooling curves, which have three phases and two phase changes, the partial heating and cooling curves only have two phases and one phase change. The first positive or negative slope is the first phase given in the problem. The second positive or negative slope is the second phase given in the problem. And the plateau represents a phase change between the first and second phase uh, that is represented in the problem. And the temperature of the plateau is the melting or the boiling point, depending on which phase change is represented. All right, so let's use what we just learned about how to interpret partial heating and cooling curves with this example down here. So example three says, a sample of substance is a liquid at A degrees. So what we know here so far is that the sample of the substance is a liquid to begin with at 80 degrees, right? The sample is heated uniformly to 160 degrees Celsius. The heating curve for the sample at standard temperature, uh, sorry, at standard pressure shown below. So as we know at 80 degrees, as the problem states, it must be a liquid. So what we can assume is that since we start out here as a liquid and this represents only one phase or a positive slope, we can assume that this first phase must obviously be a liquid because that's the only information they gave us. If it says that the first phase is a liquid, and you've only got one phase based on a positive slope, it's obviously only going to be liquid, right? Since this is a heating curve, this phase change logically would obviously be evaporation from liquid to gas, because if you got a phase change of some kind in your heating, you got to go forward in um, 
terms of the phase changes, which means you got to go towards a gas. So this first phase change will be liquid to gas. And obviously the hotter and second final phase would obviously be gas because gases are higher in temperature on a heating curve in terms of phase than uh, liquids are. So the second and final phase change logically would be a gas because gases have to come after liquids in heating curves. Okay. So um, A says, during which time intervals is the substance only one phase, and what phases are they? So obviously, as I just stated, the substance is liquid at 80 degrees. And since it's only one phase, as indicated by the positive line here, this must obviously be a liquid. This next phase must logically be a gas, because gases on a heating curve will logically come after liquids. So A, B, and C, D would represent the sing singular phases. A, B is a liquid because the substance starts as a liquid at 80 degrees Celsius, so the first phase must obviously be liquid as indicated by this positive line. On the other hand, um, C, D must be a gas for the following reason. Just like I said before, the substance, since it's heated, the next logical phase would be a gas after evaporation. And obviously evaporation, um, is in BC, and BC is the time interval during which the substance phase changes, which is the answer to 3B. And BC is evaporation because the substance is a liquid at 80 degrees Celsius, and since it's heated, the next logical, the only logical phase change, rather, sorry, from a liquid after heating would be evaporation. That's the only thing that can happen. You're not going to freeze because that's going backwards. So obviously, if you're heating and you have a phase change, the only logical phase change after a liquid would be evaporation, right? All right, so what's the boiling point of the sample? As we know, the boiling point always has to be equal to the temperature of evaporation. The evaporation occurs here in interval BC, and the temperature, the Y value here, is 120 degrees Celsius, right? Um, BC, obviously, again, like I said, is evaporation. The temperature during evaporation is the boiling point. So the boiling point here is the Y value of BC in terms of temperature, which is 120 degrees Celsius. Okay, so there you go. Um, we just stated this before, so I'm not going to say this again. Let's try example four now. It says, shown below is a compound being cooled at a constant rate starting in the gas phase at 120 degrees Celsius here, and it ends at 7 degrees Celsius here, right? So logically, if you're starting at 120 degrees Celsius and you're changing the temperature, and that would imply only one phase. Since you're starting at 120 degrees Celsius and you've got only one phase as indicated by this negative line here, for a cooling curve, that logically would be a gas. If you're starting as a gas and you have only one phase, as indicated by this negative slope, um, it obviously would be a gas, right? Now, um, this the, this uh, flat line obviously indicates a phase change because during a phase change, temperature doesn't change, but the potential energy does. Since it's a cooling curve, the only logical phase change after a gas would, would be uh, condensation, which I'll label with the C-O-N-D right here, right? Then logically after that, if you're cooling down to another phase, then you've obviously got to have a liquid. The reason for this is because you have a gas and you're cooling on a cooling curve. If you go to another phase after gas, the le next logical phase would be a liquid because a liquid is a cooler than a gas, right? So liquid would be the next logical phase. Okay, so A says, what is the condensation point of the compound, right? So um, 50 degrees Celsius would be the condensation point here. The reason for that is the following. So let's break this down one by one. All right. As we know, condensation occurs between time intervals two minutes and six minutes because it's what comes after the gas phase and it's before the liquid phase, right? So there you go. And as we know, condensation is um, the temperature of condensation, and the condensation occurs between time minutes two and four. So we just got to find the y value to find the condensation point. The y value at condensation is 50 degrees Celsius, right? So there you go. Uh, the condensation point would be 50 degrees. So to explain this more succinctly and much more beautifully, the whole idea is this. As we stated before in the problem, the substance is um, a gas at 120 degrees Celsius. So obviously the first phase here would obviously be gas because it's a gas to begin with at 120 degrees Celsius, right? So cooling, when you get a flat line or a phase change, would obviously lead to the phase change of condensation before it become a liquid because condensation, first of all, is the only cooling related or exothermic phase change that involves a gas. So there you go. That's why this would be the condensation uh, phase change because it's because cooling leads to the uh, phase change of condensation before it would become a liquid. And condensation is the only cooling-related or exothermic phase change that involves a gas. Okay? Therefore, we have to find the Y value here to find the condensation point. The Y value is 50 degrees Celsius, so that's our condensation point. Now...
Now in B, it says, state what happens to the average kinetic energy between minute two and minute six. So minute two and minute six, let's see what happens. So during this time, as we can see, the temperature is constant because it's not changing. It's at 50 degrees Celsius, which is the um, condensation point, right? Since the temperature is constant, we know that the average kinetic energy would be constant during minute two and minute six since the temperature is not changing and temperatures relate to average kinetic energy. So the short answer is the average kinetic energy is constant between minute two and minute four, minute six here, sorry, because the temperature is constant. Since the temperature is constant, the average kinetic energy is constant between minute two and minute six, okay? Now, C says draw a heating curve for the same compound starting in the liquid phase and in the solid phase. So if we start in the liquid phase, um, we obviously would have to start at the bottom here, right? And from a liquid, you would have to go to the final phase of gas. So our first phase would be a liquid. Then obviously to go get to the next phase during a heating curve, you would have to undergo evaporation from liquid to gas. And our final phase would be gas. So basically, whenever you start in any phase, you have to go all the way to the end from where you start. Okay, so I started a liquid and I go up to gas. So I only have liquid followed by the next logical phase change, which is from liquid to gas since, you know, the only logical phase change after liquid is uh, evaporation. And then I go to the next logical phase change, which is the hotter phase, then a liquid, which is a gas. Okay. On the other hand, with a solid, you would start at a solid. Then obviously the next logical phase change would be solid to liquid since melting comes after solid. Then the next logical phase after a solid would be liquid because liquid's slightly hotter than a solid. Then the last logical phase change after a liquid would be um, evaporation, which is from liquid to gas, since evaporation must come, obviously, after a liquid occurs. Then the next uh, and final logical phase that must come after you've evaporated everything is obviously a gas, so the last phase would be a gas. So basically what you do is whichever phase you start with, you have to go all the way to the end to reach a gas at the top. If you start with the liquid, you've obviously got a partial heating curve where you got a liquid, then you've got evaporation as the next logical phase change after a liquid, then you've got gas as the final thing. Whereas with the solid, you start at solid, you go to melting after that, then you go to a liquid, then after that you get um, evaporation, then finally you have a gas. So it's different depending on what you start with, but just make sure you draw properly as such. Um, and make sure you read this blurb up here as a summary. Okay? Now, um, let's try example five. It says, heat is added to a sample of liquid carbon monoxide starting at blah, blah, Okay, so let's speed this up. So it's represented by CO uh, liquid plus heat giving you CO gas. Dro complete the heating curve below. So as we can see here, you start off as liquid carbon monoxide and you go to um, a gas at the end because we start off as COL here and CO gas here. So where we have to start off at is a liquid here, and then we gotta go all the way to the end until we reach a gas. So after a liquid, we get a phase change because a phase change must always follow a phase and vice versa. So a phase change must always follow a phase. So the next logical step would go to um, a hotter temperature phase, which would be liquid to gas. So this, after this positive slope would be a flat line for a phase change, which is liquid to gas. And then the final phase would obviously be the gas, which is where you have to end. And that's represented by a positive slope on a heating curve, right? So you have a liquid, then you have a phase change, liquid to gas. Then following that, you should have a gas, which is the hottest phase because it's a heating curve. All right, so again, you start at the liquid phase as indicated by the problem. And then you have to travel all the way up to the gas phase. So if you do that, starting from the liquid phase, you wind up only getting two phases when you, when you go all the way up to the end where the gas is. So you only have two phases, which are the two positive slopes for liquid and gas, and you've only got one phase change in between liquid and gas, which is the evaporation, represented by this flat line right here for this partial heating curve. Only if the problem mentioned a solid uh, changing to a liquid, then a gas, would you actually draw a full heating curve? Because then you would start solid, then go to solid to liquid, then you go from liquid to liquid to gas to gas. But since this only starts with a liquid, you get a partial heating curve where you go from liquid to liquid to gas to gas, which gives you um, two positive slopes for the two phases, liquid and gas, and one phase change or one flat line representing the phase change of um, evaporation going from liquid to gas. Okay?